whether you know it or not, there is a spiritual war going on for your life. You are in a war against principalities, powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness. The devil is at work in our world, in our culture. He's at work in your life. He's targeted you because you are a threat to the enemy. He wants you to live in compromise so that your anointing is paralyzed. Deception's crazy, man. That's why we don't live our lives based on feeling. We live our lives based on the conviction of what the word says. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you don't belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. You'll never fit in. Because God didn't build you to fit in. He built you to be set apart. But you can't go into battle without protection. And not only are you going to fight back, but God is fighting for you. And so I want to talk to you today that you've been getting beat up. You've been getting beat down. You're broken and you're just exhausted and you're weary. I came to tell you today, then fight back, then fight back. If you're tired of getting beat up, then fight back. If you're ready for part three in God's word today, look at somebody and tell them I literally cannot wait for part three today. Then fight. Then look at somebody else and tell them you need to fight back. Look at somebody you don't know and tell them you also need to fight back. It's somebody you don't know. Somebody you don't know. Then fight back. If you're tired of getting beat up, fight back. Fight back. Fight back. We've been in a, a, a series and it's um, based on the armor of God in Ephesians chapter 6. And I, I want to read just verses 12 through 18 today today we're closing this out today we're gonna land this plane today it's 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 gonna land i think we'll see for we wrestle not against flesh and blood look at somebody and tell them my battle is not against you even though it feels like sometimes it is even though it felt like on the way to church this morning it was some of you know who i'm talking about you argued all the way here You fought each other, but you're here. Time to lay down your weapons. You're in church. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having your girded your waist with truth, putting on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, take the shield of faith, which which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints god we thank you for this morning we thank you for your word god we thank you that you give us a guidebook in life you give us a a road map through your word that you give us love encouragement direction god that you inspect us that you correct us and that your word protects us Speak to us today. In Jesus' name, we all say amen, amen, amen. And Monty, it is good to have you back, my brother. I love you. Above all, take the shield of faith. Will you say that out loud with me? Above all, take the shield of faith. Look at somebody and tell them, above all, take the shield of faith. Above all. Above all, today's part three, and if I could subtitle this fight back for today, I would subtitle it, Above All. Above all, take the shield of faith. In fact, we're going to look at the final three pieces of armor today, along with prayer at the end. But the next piece of armor in our series is the shield of faith. He says, above all, take the shield of faith. Above all else, everything is important. All the pieces of armor are important. But above all, take the shield of faith. Why does he say that? Why does he say above all, take the shield of faith? 
because the devil targets your faith. And if the devil can get your faith, he's got your future. Because faith is about my hope. It's about my belief, right? It, it, it's about me saying, I believe that God's going to do it even though it doesn't look good right now. And so the devil targets your faith. If he can take out your faith, he can take out your future. I don't know about you, but I'm not ready to give up my future. I'm not ready. I'm not going to give up my future. I'm not going to let the fires of today burn down my future. And so he says, above all, take the shield of faith, right? Faith is my hope. It's my belief. It's my trust in God. Hebrews chapter 11, there's an entire chapter about faith. Uh, a lot of people call it the faith chapter or the hall of faith because all these people of faith are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. You can read that entire chapter on your own later and you can read who made it into the hall of faith. But Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, it says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not See, let's read it out loud together. Ready? Here we go. Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. You guys kind of came to church like, you know, like, I don't know, I'm kind of a beaten down Chris, but I want a victorious church to read this out loud with a little bit of energy and a little bit of like fire and a little bit of passion. Do I got any champions in here today that want to help me with this? Let's read it again. Now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. I love that. I am confident in what I cannot see. I don't see it with my eyes, but I see it with my mind. I am so confident. I am completely confident about what I hope for. Does anybody hope for something today? Like you're hoping, you're believing, you need God to do something. I'm so confident that God is going to do it, even though I cannot see it. That's what faith is. I, I, I'm completely sure about it. Assured. I'm completely sure that God is going to do it, even though I can't see it. With my physical eyes, I see this addiction. But with my spiritual eyes, all I can see is freedom. With my physical eyes, all I see is brokenness. But with my spiritual eyes, I see God putting the broken pieces back together. With my physical eyes, I see, I can see my marriage doesn't look so good. But with my spiritual eyes, I can see restoration and healing and wholeness. I'm standing here at the bottom of this dark pit but all I can see is the palace I'm standing here at the edge looking at this red sea but all I can see is the promised land I'm confident of it I'm assured of it I have no doubts no doubts y'all are quiet today I came to preach but I need preach back I need some preach back James chapter 1 verse 6 it says but let him ask in faith with no what Doubting for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Listen, the devil wants you doubting. He wants you to live your life in doubt. Because when you live your life in doubt, you are unstable. And your life, it wavers back and forth. It is wavering and it's driven by the winds, by the waves of the sea. See, God wants you to be driven by the Holy Ghost, by the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants you to be driven by the winds of the Holy Spirit. The devil, he wants you doubting. So I am, I am confident in my God. I am focused on God. I am driven by God. I'm confident in what I hope for. I'm sure of what I am hoping for. I have an unwavering belief 
that God's going to do it. That it's going to happen. I'm confident that it's going to happen. I'm confident that this shall come to pass. I'm confident that my healing is complete. I'm confident that my marriage will thrive. I'm confident that my child will come home. I'm confident that my child will be protected and unaffected by whatever it is that they're going through. Because my faith is in God. It's not wishful thinking. It's not like, yeah, I hope. No, my, my hope is in God. You remember Proverbs chapter 3? And it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord. The Lord. It doesn't say trust in your husband. (laughs) That would be dangerous. With all of your heart. It doesn't say trust in your career. With all your heart. Trust in your net worth with all your heart. Some of you do. He he doesn't say, trust in your spouse, trust in your situation, trust in, he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. In all your ways, somebody say all your ways, all your ways, all your ways, not some of your ways. All of your ways. Oh, I submit to him and I, and I submit to him in this area of my life, but not this area of my life. He says, in all of your ways, submit to him and he will make, he will make your path straight. Your path might not look straight right now. Your path is being crooked. It's been up. It's been down. It's been all around. He says, in all your ways, submit to him. So I'm confident because I trust in the Lord with all my heart. I'm confident because I do not trust in my own understanding. I'm confident because as I submit to God, he will straighten this whole mess out. I don't have to try to straighten it out. Above all, say it again. Above all, take the shield of faith, which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one Uh, another translation says the flaming arrows of the wicked one Uh, the wicked one the, the, the evil one above all take up the shield of faith as you study this word shield in the greek it it comes from a word thurios t-h-u-r-e-o-s thurios and and it it means this oblong like door-shaped shield Roman soldiers would have a couple shields. They have a little small shield for battle. And then they had this larger oblong door of a shield. And so if you were in the army, you would have this this shield that basically would cover your entire body. In fact, today I have a high-ranking soldier with us. And I think we should give her a round of applause. She's here to help me today. A high-ranking soldier that is going to help me. (laughs) <laughs> illustrate illustrate you stay right there right there she's a high-ranking soldier in the lord she's a woman of god but this is kind of similar to what this roman shield would look like and this shield was built for specific reasons for specific purposes you know it's not just a shield to have a shield it's a shield that has been strategically designed for the Roman soldier. And so when the enemy would come in with this flaming arrow, the devil, do we have a devil? Do we have a devil with the flaming arrow? I got a devil here, there it is right here. We got this devil that comes in with this flaming arrow. And these shields, listen, they were built to absorb the flaming arrow listen they were built with some wood around it and they were because if 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 the devil which this is pastor darison but if the devil (laughs) launched that arrow and it landed anywhere around our soldier it would light everything on fire so the shield was built to absorb to quench all the fiery darts of the devil and the devil 
He wants to light your whole world on fire and burn it down. He wants to burn it down. But God puts that fire out. Yeah. Devil, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. Be gone. Yeah. Here's the other cool thing about the way they made these shields is they made them and they built them where they could be linked together with other shields. And as they were linked together with other shields, I've got some other, sh- I got some other soldiers with some other shields. Yeah, come on, you guys. You got, we, didn't have, we didn't have all the same shields, but this gets the job done. We got other shields. And they would build this wall of shields so that they could keep marching toward the enemy, right? Uh, so that they could keep marching toward the enemy, right? Okay, stop. And then check this out, there's something cool. It's called the tortoise formation, where they could put the shield above their heads and they could also keep marching even while under attack. And as I launch these flaming aerials, oh yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go. Okay, 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 that's great, that's great. All right, soldiers and the Lord, I need you guys to go away now. That was fun. That was a good time. Great, soldier. Soldier. Soldiers and the Lord. Great job. You can go. You crushed that, Amelia, soldier of the most high God. General, what's the highest ranking soldier? Nobody knows. That's great. One of the most educated cities in the nation. And we're like, ugh. What is it? A general? Five, five star. Now we got somebody that knows what's up. <laughs> Amelia is a three star general? No, I don't know. What I'm trying to say is that the devil's targeting your faith. And he's going to keep targeting your faith. And so we have to keep that shield of faith. You know what I love about that Thurios shield, that oblong, long door type shield? Is because God covers you entirely. He covers your life. He covers your marriage. He covers your family. He covers your emotions. He covers your physical body. When you're under attack, he will protect you. He's got you covered. The other thing I I like is that they link together with the family of God. Because some of you got a shield, but you're independent. You're like that soldier off trying to be the superhero. And you're going to fall. You have to be connected. You have to be connected to the body of Christ. What I'm saying is like a lot of people, they love Jesus. They go to church sometimes. They don't really know any other believers. They don't really do life with other believers. And we have all these things, all these ministries, all these connection points through Impact Church. We have our men's Bible study. It's starting up with new direction under a guy I've known for 25 years, Pastor Lee McFarland. That's coming. Listen, we have our women's ministry under Pastor Tallene. It's coming. And they're both men's and women's Bible studies starting on July 12th. Say July 12th. July 12th. We have our Celebrate Recovery Ministry. We have our young adults, the rally ministry. We have, we have, we have, we have connection points for everybody. Listen, don't you want to do life with people that are trying to go in the same direction as you are? You know, if you're not connected to the family of God, it's your own fault. If you're not connected to the family of God, it's your own fault. The second piece of armor that he talks about here is he says the helmet of salvation. The helmet. Somebody say the helmet. The helmet. The helmet, it protects you. Right? It is protection. The helmet of what? Salvation. What does salvation mean? It means to rescue. Salvation means I get rescued. I'm, I'm saved. Right? What am I saved from? I'm saved from several things. I'm saved from eternal separation from God. 
I'm saved for all of eternity. I'm saved from a hell that I would go to and suffer for all of eternity. I'm rescued. We need a rescuer. Years ago, my oldest daughter, who is, uh, she's 22, um, but she was, I think, in eighth grade. And we went to uh, Newport Beach, where the Holy Spirit is thick and powerful at Newport Beach. And we went down to this pier, beachy area. And I'll never forget, she starts to swim. And she's, she's crazy, and she loves the ocean. She's like me. She loves the ocean. Ocean's my favorite thing on earth. Like if I could just get to the ocean, I'm good. I'll just like decompress, disengage. And I'm like, you know how some of you get high or you get drunk and stuff like that? I go to the ocean. I'm just like, the ocean is my drunk. The ocean is me getting stoned. I'm just getting sanded. I'm out on the ocean. <laughs> Kylie's the same way. And I'll, I'll never forget Kylie. She used to get out there and she's you know, wading into the water and, and and I kept thinking, like, she's getting a little little far out there. She can swim really good, but I'm thinking she's getting a little far out. Kylie, be careful. Get a little far out there. And we just happened to be right by this pier where the, the, the slope of the sand goes, like, directly down. And then it comes back up. It's just a real weird place to be swimming in the ocean. And the waves would suck you out. And they would suck you out. And eventually, I saw her get sucked under. She couldn't get back in. I saw her get sucked under, and I panicked. And as a daddy, I was like full speed, like, you know what I'm saying? Like running out in the water. She's tumbling under the water and tumbling and tumbling. And I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get her. I had to dive under the water. I can't see anything. I reach out. I had just so happened to grab her by her swimsuit. And I'm like, God, don't let this thing break. Don't let this thing break. And now I'm tumbling. My face hits the bottom of the ocean. My head hits the bottom of the ocean. We're both tumbling. Somehow, some way, by God's grace, we made it back to shore. Listen, didn't come without a cost. I coughed up and sneezed out sand and salt for days. 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 You know what? If I could rewind that moment, I would do it all again. Why? Because I love her. If I could have saved her and died, I would do it again. Because I love her. I love her. And see, that's what Christ did for us. Like the waves of sin, they're too much for us. They just suck us under and they just take us under. They just take us away. There's nothing that you can do to save yourself. You need a savior. You need somebody to rescue you. And listen, it didn't come without a cost. And it was the highest cost. In fact, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. And then in Romans 6, 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. You can't save yourself. The waves of sin are no match for you. Those waves eventually will take you down and suck you under and you will tumble and you will tumble and they will beat your life up. We need a savior. The helmet of salvation. But the helmet of salvation is not just about eternal life. The helmet of salvation is also about protection in this life. It's about protection in this life. He says, above all, take the shield of faith. And King Solomon, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, he says, above all, somebody say above all, above all, Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Above all, take the shield of faith. Above all, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Look at somebody and tell them, you need to put your helmet on. Come on, tell them, you need to put your helmet on. You need to put your helmet on. Because a helmet does you no good if you don't put it on. 
Some of you, you own motorcycles. Who owns a motorcycle? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. All right. This is clearly not the motorcycle service, but there's about eight of you. You own a motorcycle. I have seen firsthand. Nobody told me this. I have seen it. Where somebody is riding a motorcycle down the road without a helmet. I have also seen somebody ripping down the road without a helmet, but it's attached to the back of their bike. <laughs> Have you ever seen that? Raise your hand if you've ever seen that. Yeah, we've all seen that. Look at somebody tell that's really stupid. That's stupid, man. That's stupid. It's what I said last week or two weeks ago about the Bible. We have one, but doesn't do us any good if we don't use it. We have one. I got a helmet, but the helmet does me no good if I don't put it on. And, and see, the devil and his demons, they are constantly shooting these arrows at our mind. Our mind. The, the arrows of the enemy go to the mind. Because the greatest battles you'll ever fight in your life, it's not war in another country. It's not war on our home field. The greatest battles you'll ever fight in your life are right here in the head, in the mind. So the devil targets your mind. He says, above all, guard your heart. That's your mind. Because everything you do flows from it. Above all. And so the devil, he sends out his army of demons. And he starts to shoot these arrows. I got some demons. I got some army of demons. Come on, demons. Hurry. Hurry, demons. Come on out. We got an army of demons. Right? And they got all these arrows. And this is... This is the reality is if you could see into the spirit world. If you could actually see into the spirit world. This is what you would see. The devil targets our mind. We have a helmet. But we don't wear it. We have a helmet. I got a helmet right here. I'm not wearing it. This is my helmet of salvation. Now I'm protected. I mean, sort of. It's like some of your motorcycle helmets. I mean, the top piece works. The helmet of salvation. It protects you. It's there to protect you. But a lot of us don't put it on. How do you put it on? I'm so glad you asked. Because I'm about to tell you how you put it on. In the name of Jesus, be gone. Get out of here. Go, demons. Get out of here. Come on, get out of here. Get out of here. How do you put the helmet of salvation on? Okay. This is critical because the devil shoots the arrows of anxiety. He shoots these arrows of guilt, shame, regret, and insecurity. He shoots these arrows of self-worth. Low self-esteem. He shoots these arrows of temptation. He shoots arrows of perversion. Of lust. He shoots arrows of bitterness. He, he shoots arrows of jealousy. Oh, you ought to be jealous. He, he shoots arrows of, of these, these demonic evil arrows that come in and they're they, they literally there to just hopefully they land and they take, they light up. So how do you put... The helmet on. See, this is why I love the verse in Isaiah 54, 17. You guys hear me say it all. I love this verse. But this is why I love this verse. Because it says, in Isaiah 54, 17, it says, No weapon formed against you shall what? Shall prosper. It's going to be formed against you. But because of God, his protection, his power, 
the armor that he's given me, it's not going to prosper. The helmet of salvation, it, it protects us. It protects us. It, it protects our mind. Have you ever heard this statement, if the head's sick, the body's sick? It's true. If the head's sick, the body's sick. It goes for your own life. It goes for your marriage. It goes for your family. It goes for your business. If the head of your business is sick, the whole thing's sick. It, it goes for your, your team. If the head's sick, the body's sick. It goes for a nation. Hello? If the head's sick, the body's sick. If the head's sick, the body's sick. The enemy wants your head sick. He wants you sick so that you are defeated. The enemy wants you sick. So he targets the mind. He targets your mindset. Listen, we're going to go here. He targets your mentality. He, he, I, you could chop my hand off. I can live through that. You could chop my leg off. I can live through that. If you chop my head off, it's over. He's targeting your mind. And some of you are like, go ahead, devil. Shoot every arrow you have right into my head. And you wonder why life is a living hell. You wonder why you're depressed. Go ahead, devil. Uh, ha wreak havoc on my mind. And so you're under attack. He's going after your mind. I'm not trying to scare you. I am trying desperately to prepare you to put on the helmet of salvation. Your greatest battle is in the mind. If the devil can mess up your mind, he can mess up your family. He can mess up your marriage. He can mess up your values. He can mess up your convictions. He can mess up your passions. He can mess up your dreams, your very calling. So the helmet of salvation, it protects our mind, but you got to freaking put it on. You got to put it on. So I have not answered the question yet. How do you put it on? I'm going to tell you how you put it on. And it's not a one-time thing. It's every day. You get up and you put it on. The way you put your helmet on is you are insanely protective and selective about what you give your eyes to and what you give your ears to. Both are attached to your head. Listen, some of you look at whatever the heck comes in front of you. Some of you listen to whatever you, whatever, whatever, this is cool. If you want to put the helmet of salvation on, you have to protect your ears and your eyes. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 and 22. It says, my son, my son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Don't let them depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to all Their flesh. And then the next verse says, above all else, guard your heart. Give, give your ear to God's word. Give your eyes to God's work. Don't depart. Above all else, guard your heart. Listen, th there are certain people in your life, listen, I, I don't mean to be this like your homies. There are certain people in your life you'd be better off without. I, I always think of this. Think about who you hang around the most. Can you do that for a minute? And can you identify those people? And I don't mean physically. Who, who, who is in your life the most? Right? Do they push you? And I mean push, push, push.
push, push you towards Jesus Christ? Or do they pull you and pull you and pull you and pull you away from Jesus Christ? And if it's a pull, they got to go. They got to go. My greatest wins in life, mine, my greatest wins in life have nothing to do with me and everything to do with who was around me. I'm not selling myself short, don't worry. I'm telling you a fact. My greatest wins have nothing to do with me and everything to do with the people around me. Coach Mike, I grew up on the playground, man. I know how to pick a team to win. I know how to pick a team. And I'm picking a team that wins. And I'm picking the people in my life that win. And what do I mean by win? I mean men of God, women of God, that live by the same moral standard, the same conviction, the same values. It's influence. I'll win. I'll win. You know how many sports games I won because of who was on my team? I ran a church basketball league one time. We had like 150 church dudes playing in this basketball league. Well, I'm, I'm a pro sports chaplain, man. <laughs> I came with a six foot 11 former D1, you know, athlete. I came with another six foot four dude that he now has played pro basketball for 20 straight years. I came with bangers. We won. Wasn't even close. Hands down won. And all the little church people, it's like, ah, you stacked your team. Well, of course I stacked my freaking team. I came to win. <laughs> Look at somebody and tell them, stack your freaking team. Stack your freaking team. Stack your freaking team. <laughs> Who's on your team? Who's on your team? Who's even on your team? You know, because some of you, you got negative people on your team. They're always boohooing, whining, complaining. My God, spare me. Jesus. So you know how they say some people see the glass half full and some people see it half empty? Uh, some people just don't even see anything in it at all. There's an ounce in there. There's an ounce. That's good. I don't know what if there's an ounce in there or not, like, gone. I'm not saying you can't love them, but you need to love those people from a distance. Because they will rub off on you and they will, they will influence you and you will become negative. You, who's on your team? Judgmental? You got judgy critical people all the time if you do you're going to end up judgy and criticky is that a word it is now we can say judgy we can say criticky it's hard to be honest with ourselves is it not are you judgy and criticky ask your spouse they'll tell you be okay with the answer because it's probably true Who's on your team? Are you around defeated people? All the, I want to be around winners, man. I, I don't want to be like, that mountain's so big, Mike. I want to be around like, dude, that mountain is there to show the miracle of God. Because I'm going to get onto the other side of the mountain. <laughs> the ear gate and the eye gate become the heart. What you allow into your ears and into your eyes become your heart. I'm going to say it again. What you allow into your eyes and into your ears, that's your, that's your ear gate, your, 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 your eye gate. It becomes who you are. You just watch the news, watch some of you. You know, there's a thing called social media. Did you know you can unfollow people? I just unfollowed somebody yesterday. 
And I don't follow that many people anymore, but I'm going to keep trimming. I'm going to keep trimming. If you post something I don't like, I'm going to unfollow it. If it's not with my morals, my standards, my values, where I'm headed, why do I want, to, why do I want it going into my eye gate? You, you, can, you can unsubscribe. You, the, you don't have to watch the news. You're like, well, then I won't know what's going on. No, you might actually have sanity and mental health in your mind. You, you, you might be better off turning off the news and turning on the good news in your life. And put... I'm not done. Music? Oh. Oh, hey, I got to take these off to talk about this for a minute. I got these new glasses. I don't even know if I like them, but I, I can see. I battle with music. Does anybody else? You're with me? If you're with me, raise your hand. If you got it figured out and you're like super Christian, raise your hand. You're like, oh, I'm super Christian. I only listen to Jesus music. I battle with it. I, I battle with it because like when I go work out, it's just hard to be like, he is a miracle and like, <laughs> and like, I'm such a like rap dude, like hip hop. Like I got, it's just like, I was the kid where my mom was like, you should not be listening to that, Travis. I just listened to the beat, ma. <laughs> You're not just listening to the beat, ma. You're not. You're not. So I decided to do a little study just because, I don't know, I decided this would be interesting. So I looked up two. Two of the top five hip-hop songs of 2023. Two, I just, I just, I'll go two. It's the first two I looked at. And I looked at the lyrics. And number one right now is Nikki McNasty. <laughs> or whatever. If you strip. If you strip something, Jared, of the beat, what are you listening to? <laughs> I feel like I can't even read this to you. <laughs> like we're in church. I, if there's kids, you need to cover your ears. We have kids ministry. I can lick it. I can ride it. While you slipping and sliding, I can do them little tricks and keep the D up inside it. You can smack it. You can grip it. You can go down and kiss it. And every time he leave me alone, he always tell me he miss it. Number one. Number one. Don't act like you're so righteous, you don't know what all that means. <laughs> That's number one. I looked up another one, and I'm not going to get that into this one, but this girl's name is Cardi Beezy or something. If I had a D, you'd probably lick it like a lollipop. Top five. All you can do is laugh because it's that uncomfortable. But when you're in the gym and that thing, you're just like, yeah, man, you can lick it. You can ride it. You can slide it. You can blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Like, what are we doing? What are we doing? We, we're taking the helmet off. And that, listen, it influences you. Music creates moods. It influences you. Music is powerful. Words are powerful. They say, I'm just listening to the beat. Jesus said, words, words 
Words are powerful. You can kill people with your words. You can raise them back to life with your words. Words. Movies. Ah, it's a movie. We watch stuff we would, like, if it were real life happening in front of us, we'd be so offended. But it's a movie. It influences you. It influences you. It influences you. David said in Psalm 119, 37, he said, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Remember, Jesus talked about the eyes. He said, your eye is the lamp of the body. He said, if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. What do you give your heart to? Jesus said in Luke 6, 45, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Do you want to know what's in your heart? Start paying attention to your mouth because that's what's in there. You want to know what's in your heart? Are you negative? Are you always judgy? Are you critical? Are you always worried? Are you always fearful? Are you always anxious? Are you always mad? Are you always angry? Are you always on head? You want to know what's in your heart? Listen to your mouth. And be honest. Because just because it's that way now doesn't mean it needs to be that way today or tomorrow. Because we serve a God who changes us. The next thing he says, the sword of the spirit. Somebody say the sword. Sword. I got to finish today. I have to. I have ADHD and I hate doing message series. I know they're probably good, but I like preaching once and then moving on. The sword of the spirit and the sword of the spirit, which is the what? The word of God. Now, I collect, many of you know this, I collect Bibles, antique Bibles. I have an antique Bible here on stage, and um, this is just one of mine. This one is from 1856. But I I have Bibles from the 1600s, 1700s, 1800s. I think the oldest Bible I have is maybe 1630-something. I figure, you know, some of y'all like to collect stuff. You collect baseball cards or sports memorabilia you have a lot of money so you collect real cars and you keep them at the stables and you like collect houses some of you collect houses I mean since got still paradise valley some of you collect houses I collect bibles I I just there's nothing more important to me than this so I collect bibles if you were to go into my office you would see um, my Bible collection. I have Bibles. It's the thing. It's the thing everybody asks. It's the first. It's the first thing everybody that ever goes into my office. They go, "What? What is this? This is cool." Like I got like I got like sports memorabilia too. You know, I got like you know all the super famous athletes with their jerseys and signatures. I have so many. I wouldn't have. I, I would fill this entire wall up probably with like jerseys because I've been doing that for 21 years. But I only have a few hanging in my office, but nobody cares. Everybody goes, what's this? That's really cool. It's my Bible collection. He says, the sword of the spirit. I love this because the sword is the only piece of armor that is offensive, but also defensive. The, 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 the sword. See, a lot of times we, you, Me, we use the Bible, we use the sword, but only as a defensive weapon, right? We pull it out when we get in trouble. We we pull it out when we're in a valley. We pull it out when we're under attack. Oh man, I'm under attack. I better I better go to God's word. Oh man, my marriage is under attack. Man, my 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 fam, my health is under. I better go find some scripture. I better get under. And so we use it a lot of times as a defense mechanism. 
which is, which is good. But the Bible is not only here to get me out of trouble. It's also here to keep me out of trouble. It's not just a defense mechanism. It is an offensive mechanism. See, the, the Roman soldiers sword. Do you say it with the W or no? Because I do. It has a W in it. Did you know that? Is the W silent? Who cares? <laughs> My wife makes fun of me for some words I say. I say some of you say comfortable. Com I can't even say it the way you say it. Com com comfortable? Comfortable. It's spelled comfortable. Com comfortable. So I say comfortable. I say sword. It's spelled sword. <laughs> and spelt isn't even a word. But their sword and their shield would, would work together. It's interesting because they actually had a, you think of a big sword, but they had a smaller sword, like a dagger type sword. And the smaller is easier to work with and maneuver. And, and, but what's interesting is, you know, I'm not a fighter, <laughs> if you didn't know. <laughs> and I just think of like, a shield and a sword, but like the, the, the intricacies of the training and the techniques and, and, and the fact that he uses the word of God as this depiction of the sword of the spirit. And a Roman soldier didn't just have a sword. He was highly trained in how to use the sword. See, that's what I think. I think we all have a sword. We're just not all highly trained in how to use it. Swordsmanship. When I was a little kid in Sunday school, they used to do these things called sword drills. And you'd hold your Bible in the air. And you know, there's whatever, eight of you. And they would go, Ephesians 3.20. And you had to pull your Bible down. You had to flip over to Ephesians 3.20. And whoever got their first one. Sword drills. Am I saying it better for you guys? Sword? Sword drills. <laughs> now we have Google. Now, now, now we have Google. We're just like, I don't know, I'll Google it. I don't know where it is. We used to memorize the books of the Bible. Now it's like, I'll just, I'll just Google it. I'm asking you to ask yourself, how is your swordsmanship? How is your swordsmanship when it comes to God's word? You know what's cool about the Bible? This is what I've found to be true is that it's really not just one sword. It's like a book filled with swords. And as you begin to l learn it, Memorize it. Pray it. You start becoming pretty good with your sword. Do you know God's word? Do you know how to use God's word? See, you have God's word all around you. But do you have it in you? Because listen... There might come a time when God's word is no longer all around you. And the only thing you've got is what's in you. Swordsmanship. Jesus gave us an amazing illustration about putting the sword to work. There's this passage in Matthew chapter 4 where Jesus was tempted by the enemy. Jesus had been in the wilderness praying and fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And the enemy comes in and it says, the enemy says, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Isn't that just like the devil to like target your vulnerabilities? 
He's coming after your weaknesses. He's coming after your vulnerability. Stop paying attention to your strengths. He's not coming after those. He's coming after your weaknesses, your vulnerabilities. Jesus is in the wilderness praying, fasting, 40 days, 40 nights. The Bible says he was hungry. See, that's what the devil does is he comes to us and he attacks us in our vulnerabilities. But Jesus, he pulls out the sword. Now listen, in Jesus' time, the Hebrew children were required to memorize the first five books of the Bible because that was the only books of the Bible. They were required to memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Why? Because it was their law. And little boys had to memorize it by the time they were 12 years old. So Jesus is under attack, the temptation of the devil, and Jesus pulls out the sword. And he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, and he says, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on the very word that comes from the mouth of God. And listen, in verse 5 it says, Then the devil took him up to the holy city and saw him and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. And he says, If you are this, listen, if you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is, this is the devil, for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike foot against your stone. This is crazy, y'all, because now the devil's quoting scripture. It's a sword fight. And the devil's trying to use God's own words against him. And he quotes from Psalm, my favorite Psalm, chapter 91, verse 12, when he says, he's going to command his angels concerning you, and they'll lift you up in their hands. They'll catch you. Jesus, again, quotes and puts his sword to work in Deuteronomy 6.16. He says, it is also written, don't put the Lord God to the test. And then in verse 8, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. And all this I will give to you, he said, if you bow down and worship me. You know that the devil will always offer you the temporary things of this world if you just bow down in exchange for your soul. He'll always offer you money, sex, power, possessions, popularity. If you just bow down. Jesus, I'll give you all the kingdoms of this. Bro, they're not yours to give. God created the heavens and the earth. God created the heavens and the earth. You got to understand this. You have to understand this. Listen, Impact Church family, you have to understand this. The devil will offer you the emptiness of this world in exchange for your soul. The devil would love nothing more than to bless you. He wants to bless you with the things of this world. He wants to bless you so much that it buries you. That you sell out like Judas did. That you compromise your calling. That you sell out your divine purpose for worldly possessions. The devil will try to feed you so much of the world that it starves out God's word. But Jesus stands strong, and he again quotes for the third time, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. Away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and the angels came and attended him. The sword. The sword. 
It is our offensive weapon. I don't think people always understand what's the purpose of the Bible. The Bible sums up its purpose. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Look at this scripture. 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says, All scripture, somebody say all. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What is the Bible for? It teaches you, it rebukes you, it corrects you, it trains you, it equips you. If you read it. This same passage to me is crazy because you know there's context. Every verse has a context. So if I tell you, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave us this context. God was talking to a religious leader named Nicodemus. Nicodemus sneaks to over to Jesus in the middle of the night so he won't be seen with Jesus. Jesus, what must I do to be saved? There's context. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. I am the son, by the way. There's context. 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is God-breathed. What's the context? The context is in the verses before this. In verses 1 through 5. Look what this says. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of good, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Yo, have nothing to do with such people. Then a few verses after that, it goes on to say that people are going to be swayed and people are going to be deceived. And then he says, all scripture, all scripture. He sang, he sang, stand strong on the word of God. All scripture is God breathed. The breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the feet with peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. And then Paul ends with pray always. Pray always. Praying always with prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. You know, prayer is not one of the pieces of armor that he points to on the soldier's armor. He points to the six pieces of armor. But then the next thing he says is, pray always. Pray. Pray, 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 pray. Don't stop praying. Don't stop communicating with God. Pray always. I've told you my favorite scripture many times is Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. And it says, now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly what's it say above all above all above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever amen I pray to God and I trust in God and I'm confident in the one who is able to do 
exceedingly, abundantly, above all. I can ask a thing. You know that the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, talking about Jesus specifically, it says, And being formed in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. Even death on a cross, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above all. The name above all names. That at that name, the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Above all. The name above all names. Would you pray with me? Today I want to invite those of you who have never taken on the helmet of salvation to take your helmet today. That Jesus died for you he paid the highest price for you to forgive you to cover you in his grace in his love that God so loved you so very much that he gave his one and only son to die for you and that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life and today, you're here today and you say, you know what? I feel like that is me. Today, I want to take up the helmet of salvation. Today, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I, I want to surrender. I want to, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ today. If that's you, I want you to pray from your own mouth, from your own mind and say Jesus today I give you my life thank you for giving me yours thank you for dying for me thank you for paying the highest price for me thank you for that cross at Calvary thank you for the punishment that you endured that I may be free And if you prayed that prayer, the Bible says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth, if you believe with your heart that Jesus is Lord, it says you, you shall be saved. If you prayed that prayer today, you are now a part of the family of God. And God, pray that you would teach all of us the disciplines of putting on daily the armor of God. God, we're thankful for your scripture. We thank you that all scripture is God-breathed. We thank you, God, that it is your word where David said, I've hidden your word in my heart that I, I won't sin against you. That David said in Psalm 119 that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. That Hebrews 4, it says for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints, and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. God, we're grateful for your word, that it's life to us, that it's living, that it's active. Let us fall in love with your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all say amen. amen, amen. Well, Impact Church, thank you for being here. Feel free to stand and worship with us. If you need to go, you can go as well. Feel free to stay as long as you want. God bless you. Have a great 4th of July week.